MLOps in general should not be looked at as one person's responsibility. I think fundamentally you've got to have data engineers in there. There's so much that happens on the data layer that later you can't just like skip over that and then be like, we're going to just do ML or AI now because that's, that's again, that's like a recipe for disaster. Yesterday, I was talking to a guy who has a startup in the healthcare space and he launched his startup and nine months ago, he didn't even know how to code. And he learned everything that he needed to know to create the product. And his product is having a ton of success. So there's so many reasons why this shouldn't work. And he's just killing it because he has been able to bring this product mindset and building and really caring about the end user and building that empathy into the product and getting the feedback. And, and then when he doesn't know how to do something, he figures it out and he's resourceful enough to go and figure it out. So if you want, it, it just reminds me like, man, we can do anything. There's no blockers at all. Like blockers are all in our mind. That is the only thing that blocks us. There's a vibe of openness that I think you bring in your community and encouraging um, people to be very open. So I, I wanted to kind of highlight that as, as a lesson for those in doing communities, thinking of starting communities as well. Basically for the community, by the community, <laughs> the for us, by us. It's the FUBU of ML ops. One of my sales mentors says, you have to find out what the three W's are, or some people call it the three Y's. Why buy anything? Why buy us? And then why buy now? And you want to really dig in on those three W's. How many more ML ops companies have you seen pop up given the LLM sort of explosion? I think they don't market themselves as ML ops companies anymore. Mm. Is that so 2020? Right? And funny. Welcome to episode seven of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today we have Demetrius Brinkman. Um, he's the founder and CEO of MLOps Community, one of the best places to learn and collaborate on all things MLOps. Check out his MLOps Community Podcast, where you'll get deep insights from the brightest minds in MLOps with over 295 episodes. I think you're at 298 now, just to be specific. Um, hmm. Most importantly, I think today we'll learn about how to build a successful, successful technical community. Demetrius, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm very excited to be here. And judging by the conversation we've been having, I am even more excited for what we're about to get into. Yes, I, being a community leader is not easy. I, I'll, I'll jump into my story on my version of uh, communities and different things, yeah. but how has MLOps changed with the advent of LLMs? Oh my God, so much. Hmm. That's where we're going to start. That's a great place yeah, to I start. Yeah, I wanted to throw so, you under the bus real quick. You know? Yeah, yeah, that is so good. <laughs> I, I laugh because in... The beginning half of last year, so 2023, after ChatGPT came out and it was gaining a ton of traction and then all of a sudden, a lot of people are starting to play with tools like Langchain and Llama GPT or Llama Index. Uh, I think at that point it was still called GPT Index. And mm -hmm. then there was this, it, it was almost like there was this moment of, hmm, the MLOps community is very focused on certain things that have nothing to do with this whole new paradigm of LLMs because now you can be an application developer and leverage LLMs and you don't really care much about all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, right? You don't care much about all of this, now it's getting more popular, like the fine tuning and, and that good stuff. But it feels like the conversations that were happening from the MLOps community in December 2022 versus the conversations that happened in December 2023. Now, if you're an ML engineer and you're not working on LLMs, you probably want to be which can be mm -hmm. annoying, especially I, I talk to friends and they say like, I'm trying to hire for ML engineers and we don't have LLM 
use cases and mm-hmm. everybody just wants to be working on LLMs. And so there's that piece. And then the other piece is like, oh, for a while I was having an identity crisis because I didn't know if ML ops was the passing fad and the new kid on the block was what everyone was calling LLM ops. And so it was like, oh man, am I going to have to do a rebrand? Are we going to have to shift to this to be called the LLM ops community? And so much so that one of the community members, as a joke, bought the domain LLM ops <laughs> community dot community and then just re- redirected it to the ML ops community. Oh, and yeah. I think there's some very distinct pieces when it comes to ML ops versus LLM ops. And you have some of the same personas doing stuff, but when it comes to, so there's a lot of stuff that's still the same, but there's a lot of stuff that is different. And when you're looking at the things that are different, as soon as you throw prompting in the mix and having prompt templates and all of that, you get a bit of a different workflow. That's not to say none of the things that are immensely important in ML ops, like getting your data foundations right, are not Mm -hmm. just as important in quote unquote LLM ops. And I think the term, I don't know about you, you tell me, like the term LLM ops feels like it it slowed down a little. And so maybe it's not as popular as it was six months ago. I think maybe people are confused. What I mean by that is If you think of LLM inference, there's so many different factors that go into it, right? So there's a hardware layer. Then there's a software layer on top of that hardware layer. Mm. Then there's a software layer on top of that software layer (laughs) where you're really starting to be a little more application specific. And in that application specificness, I think that's where the complexity comes in. Because, um, for instance, one library might work really well for one use case. But then you might have someone who has a very strict latency constraint. So now Mm. that really messes up your entire deployment because you might need to procure hardware that has very fast memory. Um, Mm -hmm. Then you have to balance cost. How do I now handle replicas? Replicas meaning redundancy, so failure, all those types of things. So I think what I mean by confusion is that there's so much. And I think sometimes when you watch maybe a lot of the papers, they go down to the algorithm level. Okay, what type of attention are we implementing? Or oh, we're doing in-fly batching. Fantastic. The average person ain't going to be implementing a new type of attention or a new type of, um, what you call it, in-fly batching or et cetera, et cetera. We'll be using mm-hmm. some of those things to get models deployed. So I work a lot on the in-front side. So for me, it's, it's fascinating to, to understand the different dynamics of different models. Now mm-hmm. with, Mixtrel, and now we're showcasing, hey, you have fairly decent mixture of experts models that are on reasonable hardware for the average person to deploy on the average use case. So I think you'll see this explosion. Um, and it makes sense why folks are really interested, uh, just because I feel a lot of the other ML ops content, if you were not in a good job where you got to practice a lot of that, I think it's very difficult for you to really hone that skill and, and to, mm-hmm. to push the boundary of your knowledge. Like if you're not deploying a model at Spotify, like you'll never see that's really big scale versus you yeah. deploying for your tiny little company. You, know? you bring up a, a great point too, which I think should be noted. And that is a year ago, PT was basically the only game in town. There were open source mm-hmm. models, but they were not as good at all. And so people weren't really experimenting with how they could get the latency requirements down because they didn't really have a model that could be good enough to rival ChatGPT or OpenAI mm-hmm. in general. And so you outsourced all that hard work to OpenAI. And now, like you're saying, like we've got Mistral, we've got Llama, we've got a lot of solid open source options out there and people are going deeper. Yeah, there's a lot more space to experiment. And I, I think even my own learning, I'm very excited by it just because 
there's really technical topics that you get to to explore into versus maybe playing with Kubernetes configuration files or different things. Like that. Not to say that that's not valuable. That's actually still very valuable. Um, yeah. And what's interesting there is I think folks on the, M, on the LLM in front side, if you're now getting into it, like you now have to become a software engineer. You're no longer a data scientist, I, right. in my opinion, just because you'll understand all the mechanics of prompting, um, different strategies. You're talking about LoRa's, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, if you're doing things in, in a medium organization, like you have to do all of that. Yeah. Telling your MLOps engineer, hey, I, I want to do this. He'd be like, okay, cool. But he's also now going to start becoming a data scientist as well. So there's this convergence of, in my opinion, who, who is an MLOps engineer, right? Is it an actual mm. software engineer that understands data science? Or is it a data scientist who's become a software engineer? I'm coming from the data scientist becoming a software engineer side. Yeah. Good, cool times. It, and it feels to me that MLOps in general should not be looked at as one person's responsibility. Mm. That's one place. That if you're looking to set yourself up for failure, then expect that one person can own MLOps, right? It needs to be... Mm many different personas in my eyes you i think fundamentally you've got to have data engineers in there you've got to have the and there's different ways of going about it there's if you're going to build a whole ml platform or if it's just like like wh what is the maturity level that you're at i think also speaks to a lot of this what is your company actually doing when it comes to ai and ml and how mature are you at that? Are you just pushing out one model? Or are you, you know, operationalizing hundreds of them? And mm -hmm, is it mm -hmm. just using the open AI services? Or is it you've got some BERT model that you've been using and it is absolutely tuned perfectly to all that data that you've had for years and your data engineering skills are on point. The company has a very robust process around the ML that it's doing. So when it comes to an, an ML ops engineer, I have seen that title floating around quite a bit. And I mm -hmm. understand on one hand, I understand the point of it because you want someone who can be a little bit more engineering as opposed to data science-y. And for a long time, an ML engineer you could be a data scientist and get away with calling yourself an ML engineer if you were doing the modeling part, I think. So the ML ops engineer title in my mind is to counterbalance that. It's to say, no, we want someone who's going to be able to set up the infrastructure for this machine learning or this AI that we are then putting into production. However, it shouldn't be just one person. That's, yeah. that's my thing. Mm-hmm. How does that, how do we now balance that with the size of the company? So a lot of, to a degree, MLOps, things that apply in, in a lot of the popular narratives don't necessarily map to a legacy company. I feel like a lot of companies are legacy versus mm. tech first, like a Spotify and yeah. where this mindset is very pervasive versus <laughs> I'm a tire company. Let me now go deploy some models. What the heck does that mean? Man, it is, of course, case by case basis. And sure. that there's all of the different pieces around why it would depend. But if we were to look at what I've seen people having success with in their deployment of ml one thing is very clear you can't get to ml if you don't like do the prerequisites which is having a strong data foundation so mm. being able to have the data foundation will get you so far along that then the ml shouldn't be as hard 
because you'll at least know what kind of data you have, where it's coming from, what the shape of it is, how you need to deal with it if there are requirements on like access or regulatory requirements around that. There's so much that happens on the data layer that later you can't just like skip over that and then be like, we're going to just do ML or AI now because mm-hmm. that's, that's again, that's like a recipe for disaster. I guess I'm doing the thing of like, well, I don't really know what to do. I just know what not to do. <laughs> that's, I think that's as good as knowing what to do sometimes. Um, yeah. These are just big signs. Like make sure that if you're going to do this, you are clear on your data layer and your data foundations. And then the other piece is what I've seen from others that I admire is being really diligent and focused on what opportunities there are that can give you the most juice for the squeeze. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like engineers sometimes like to overcomplicate things and over-engineer it. And is it easier just to go, like there's no shame in doing things that are not at gigantic scale or that are just hitting the OpenAI API if you can get that all cleared and or another API, like it doesn't have to be OpenAI these days. I think we've seen also that there are other valuable APIs that work well. And so being able to assess that and understanding that is where the leadership comes in and they get to s- sit down and get beyond the hype, right? Yes. Where it's not just like, we need AI for AI, it's what realistically could we do and how hard slash easy is it going to be? I feel like this year, 2024, a lot of executives don't have any more time to be like, yeah, we're going to do AI like this year. Yeah. Like their bosses are being like, hey, where where are the results of all this AI experimentation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the increase maybe? I'm very curious as to how many more MLOps companies have you seen pop up given the LLM sort of explosion? I think they don't market themselves as MLOps companies anymore because mm-hmm. that's so 2020. Right. And funny thing, again, going back to like the terms, uh, (laughs) there was a hackathon we were going to do in the MLOps community. Mm -hmm. And we were getting a VC to sponsor it. And the Mm -hmm. VC came back to me and they said, hmm, you know, we really want to sponsor it. We want to work together with you, but we're not so sure on this name, MLOps, you know? I was like, that's got to be the most VC thing I've heard in a while because they wanted it to be around LLM ops. And so what I think you see is a lot of companies now marketing themselves potentially as like LLM ops companies Mm -hmm. or just like AI infrastructure companies, I think. And even the ML ops companies now have had to figure out a way to incorporate AI into their messaging, which I find mm-hmm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. It's like everyone pivoted real hard. They're like, wait, we're we also do AI. It's just called ML, and it <laughs> and it's the ops part of ML. It's we used to call it ML ops, but now it's no, it's AI tooling or AI infrastructure, whatever you want to call it. So there's been an explosion. I, I read somewhere, and I'm going to get this wrong, but if it wasn't for like the AI category. VC last year would have had a horrible year, but since mm. AI was booming, it still felt like there was a lot of deals being done. And yes. we definitely, I've seen that all over the place. And a lot of it is novel when it comes to tooling and helping people with the tooling. And there's two, there's two things I want to mention about this. I do like another piece of it, which is just going vertical and saying, we're going to incorporate AI into our product and it's a very vertical SaaS solution for doctors or for lawyers or for tire uh, consultants, like you mentioned earlier. And then the other piece of this 
that I think is worth noting is that we're still in the early innings of what software developers and just engineers in general will be doing with AI, that it's very hard in my mind to create tooling right now that will be something people still want in five years, just mm. because of the shape and the way that things move. So it's a bit risky in my eyes to create a LLM ops tool or an ML ops tool, even for that matter. When do you think LLM ops, LLM comes out really well? Like someone just took all the Docker books, all the Kubernetes books, now all of the LLM deployment material, you train a model with that, and now you have an auto. When do you think that'll, be, that'll get to... Yeah, like, like that uh, could push I, new code to production really yeah, fast. Yeah, I've heard of a few different companies that are doing this. And mm -hmm. I've also heard of the term generative DevOps, which I think Ooh. that kind of feels like what it is, is that it's using generative AI in DevOps. I've also seen a lot of cool stuff happening with agents and autonomous agents. And mm -hmm. like you said, mm -hmm. it's not just it, it's not just figuring out where Potentially, if you're like, let's say if you're an SRE and you're having problems or you're getting woken up at four in the morning, you want to be suggested what could be wrong. And even better, maybe you want the autonomous agent to go out there and fix it or give you an idea hmm. of a fix. The only problem with that is that like agents are still in their infancy. And I think agents get a lot more credit than they deserve because they're not reliable. And so SRE is like, Ooh. that's all about reliability, right? So that's, that's my opinion. How big is your audience? So it's hard, it's hard to say these days, I think, because of the, the different manifestations of the community. Right. So we mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. 37 different cities that we're doing local meetups in. And 37? we have wow. 37, yeah. Uh, from Australia to Tel Aviv to Nairobi, uh, Lagos to Beautiful. New York. And yeah, obviously San Francisco, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty distributed across the globe. And it's people that are, are like local champions and they decide that they want to run a local meetup and they make it happen. We give them all the support they need and then they mm -hmm. make it happen ultimately. So we've got that. We've also got a big newsletter subscriber base. Like I think there's 25,000 newsletter subscribers. We've got like wow. 20,000 people in Slack. We've got whatever, 19,000 YouTube subscribers, even though YouTube subscribers don't mean much. Uh, cause YouTube's funny in that way. You know, we've got the podcast <laughs> that gets, I think it gets like between two and 6,000 downloads per episode. And we've wow. got the conferences that will get like between five and 10,000 registrants that come to. So there it's, it's hard for me to say like, oh, there's, you know, X amount of people because how many of those are overlapping or it's the same person that interacts with the community and all these different facets? Or is it that it's like the extended long tail of maybe this person just comes to meetups? And does that mean that they're even part of the community? I don't, I don't know. That's a little bit more nuanced type of thing. This is very interesting, by the way, Anna. So you've been doing this, I, I looked on your LinkedIn, for almost four years. I think it's three years and 10 yeah. months. Um, at which point did you realize you're like, shit, this thing is actually, you know, legit? Because sometimes when you start things, you just have an idea. But when did you realize that, oh, this is a legit operation? <laughs> legit. I don't know if I would call it legit even to this day, you know? <laughs> Ooh, interesting. I'm still, okay. Oh, man. The, just because I am, uh, yeah, <laughs> the... The amount of learning that I'm doing and the amount of times that I say to myself, like, I have no fucking idea what 
yeah, I'm doing right now. It, <laughs> it makes me have a, um, an aversion to be able to call myself legit. But I will mm. say that it was probably, there was like two moments that are etched out in my brain where first, the reason the community started was because COVID hit and everything went online and the company that I was at was having trouble booking sales calls. And I was the SDR, I was the sales guy there. And I was trying to get people on the phone and they weren't, they weren't getting on the phone. And so our CEO was like, what about if we try like a community thing and we do like a virtual meetup? And I just took to it like a fish in water. And about two weeks, three weeks after we started with that, that company went out of business. Mm. So I was left sitting there thinking, hmm, now what do I do? Do I continue with this community thing where there's 30 of us in this Slack group? But it seems like there's some traction, you know, there's maybe five or 10 people joining every day. So it kind of feels like this is growing pretty quick. Or do I try and get a, a new job? And I had my little daughter who was at the time she was one. And I was like, I need a job. I need like income fast. So I was applying to everything. I was applying to Zoom. I was, I think Zoom was basically the only company that was hiring in May, 2020, if you remember mm. correctly, because they were killing it. Everyone else was worried that the sky was falling. And at the end of June, I remember telling a friend, it was probably like a week before June, the month of June finished in 2020. And I told a friend, yeah, I think we might get to 600 people by the end of the month. And that would be unreal. That's like growth that I would never have imagined. Mm -hmm. And so we, we hit that like a few days later and it felt like that was one of those turning points that made me realize, okay, there might be something here. Even though now, as I look back on it, 600 feels very intimate. And those were some of the best days because you knew every single person in Slack and right. you knew all their names. And it was a different, it's a different feel then. Uh, but, but then, yeah, the other time that felt like it also etched it into my brain was when we passed like 2,000 people in Slack and we had mm. people starting to more regularly volunteer for doing things. Uh -huh. So people started to take notice. And, and I did this survey, and I think this is what the big shift in my mentality was, because I was always trying to learn. Like I had no experience running a community or doing anything with tech communities in general. And so I was trying to learn. And one of the best ways to learn is just go out and ask people, right? Ask the people that you're serving, like, what can I be doing better? And what do you like? What do you not like? So I ran a survey and I remember one of the answers, one of the things like in the last question that said like anything else, somebody was super helpful in that they said something that could have been interpreted maybe as uh, not so good, but I interpreted it as like, wow, thank you for giving me this unfiltered feedback right here. and. So in that anything else piece, they said, you know, it feels like this isn't quite a community yet. It feels like it's kind of a place where Demetrius shares stuff he's been learning about and other people chime in on that. And so that's when I realized like, I've got to make this more about we than me. And from then on, I started trying to optimize for getting others involved more than I was getting myself involved and figuring out mm -hmm. ways that I could prop people up. And so now I look at it as if I'm doing my job right, I am creating a platform to let others shine. That's, that's beautiful and impactful at the same time. And I think one of the main reasons I asked the question about your audience is that when people collaborate, I think the marketing thing has done us a disservice from the perspective of a small group of people can make a meaningful contribution. 
And that mm. does not mean that a large group of people don't make a meaningful contribution. I just think the communication dynamics in a very large group are very different. Um, and yeah. so just to highlight that, even though you have huge numbers, you're still very successful on those intimate metrics. Like you were saying, you have all of these disparate locations across the world, which are in aggregate very large, but on a small scale, uh, mm-hmm. very meaningful, it seems, to the people that are there. So I, I just wanted to commend you and, and highlight that uh, because I've also tried to start communities. I've tried to acquire communities. I've joined mm-hmm. communities. And in that process of, like you were saying, you didn't know anything and you went out there and you did certain things. I've learned um, a lot of lessons along the way by, by trial and fire, so mm-hmm. to say. Uh, that picture I have behind me, I, I went pretty hard into NFTs. So I think when you talk mm-hmm. about communities, there's nothing <laughs> on, <laughs> that runs the world like NFT communities, at least from a, a revenue generating standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, I even started a YouTube channel. That's how I got into the YouTube world, completely, you know, fell off the cliff because I realized if a teenager could do this, why the hell am I wasting my time doing this? <laughs> and um, they're a lot better at selling pictures than I was to a degree. Yeah. And, um, I did get kind of jaded with the online interactions in a lot of the NFT communities. Mm. Um, which is distinctly different to a MLOps community. But I bring that up because I think as people see your success, many people will want to replicate it. Mm. And sometimes they may want to replicate it the exact same way that you did. But oftentimes that won't work just because the way that you were successful had a very strong alignment with who you were. As I observe your brand, you know, you show up, hey, what's up? So and so and so. And, and there's a vibe of openness that I think you bring in your community and, and encouraging um, people to be very open. So I, I wanted to kind of highlight that as, as a lesson for those in doing communities, thinking of starting communities as well. Yeah, 100%. The authenticity has to be there. Otherwise, it's a, you know, you're p- pushing a boulder uphill. Did you start out like that in your, in your mindset or were you, oh, I have to kind of be like this to be successful and then you figure it I out? I think I always, I, I didn't ever consciously think about it like that, but what I realized is that it's way easier to do that hmm. because no, I don't I have to like way. put on any kind of mask and be anything for anyone. What I did try to do from the beginning is make sure that it was always fun for me since I wasn't mm-hmm. getting paid, you know, like I, I was, I needed some reason to do it. And the reason I was doing it was because I was having fun oh. and I was also learning a ton along the way. And so mm-hmm. I never really wanted to, that's one of the core things that I always try and drive home. Even now that we have like a team that works with us, it's like, how can we keep this as fun as possible and make sure that we don't lose that spirit of what the community is? And so like, there's some stuff that I, I want to even bring back, but we were always, I was always coming up with shit to do that was just like so random, but it was appealing and it was like really fun for me. Uh, I, one of the things I can think of right off the top of my head is that I, my cousin used to be in theater and he had this funny song that he would sing about taking a coffee break. So I asked him to record mm-hmm. himself doing that. And we used that as the intro to our podcast for a while. And it was just him in his living room singing it. And it was so random, but it's like, oh yeah, we're going to have that be the intro, you know? And that was the kind of stuff that I would do or introducing people on the virtual meetups with the guitar where I would try and sing their bios. That was the stuff that I realized, like, this is just fun for me. And the beauty is that nobody's there to tell me not to do it. And sometimes people have told me, well, maybe that, that might not be the best thing. I just end up doing it anyway. And if it's fun, mm-hmm. that's kind of the gauge that I go off of. That's the North Star. I'm very happy that you said that because I had acquired a, a data science community 
actually. I would, I would more put it in the camp of a data analytics community. And they had mm. like 3,500 people in Discord, um, 17,000 subscri- uh, what you call it, followers on Twitter. So this is why right. the audience thing means so much to me from an effectiveness standpoint. So the numbers in reality, what I've personally learned is that they really don't matter other than yeah. an external branding mechanism. But yeah. from a true core functionality and effectiveness standpoint, it's literally the individual people who are bringing the energy into yeah. that group of people that nothing else matters other than that input of energy from a variety of people, you know? That's so true. That's the, that's the energy. That's the, the vibe. And that is what people feel when they are interacting with the community. And I've mm-hmm. learned since also that, like I used to, I think in the beginning, I, I would talk a lot more shit, mm-hmm. especially when it came to like marketing of ML ops companies that I thought was a little bit off or it was like, nobody's actually buying this shit, are they? But now I've, maybe it's I've matured I've gotten wiser and I stopped doing that kind of stuff because I just realized like yeah these people are doing the best they can at their jobs and yeah it's probably not my place to be vocal about how shitty their marketing is or isn't and also Mm -hmm. that brings a different energy with it into the community where then people are like oh yeah this guy who's the most active in this community. He's super aggressive on how he like talks about what the companies are doing or they aren't doing. So I should also be that way potentially, or it's okay for me to be that way. And Mm -hmm. so I've kind of cut back on that. I will every once in a while, it's like, it's in my nature. I got to call some shit out. It's like, come on. Come mm-hmm. on. But I, I feel like I've tried to be a little bit nicer on that whole thing. And, and I do notice now after interacting in other tech communities that sometimes you have that first interaction in a community. And if it's not necessarily a positive interaction, you never want to go back to that community. And right. so how can we make these interactions for people that are just joining the community positive experiences yes yes indeed so a community is a place to learn yeah. in my opinion or well, one of the best places to learn um i personally judge a community by the the level excuse me the level of backlash that you get for asking a stupid question and i when i say stupid meaning something that you should know you just maybe don't understand, um, especially Mm -hmm. the more qualified you are, right? So with Mm -hmm. that, what topic, you've seen a lot of different people in your community, what topic do you think people struggle to learn the most? Mm. In ML, let's say in in ML ops. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can like pinpoint one topic. It kind of comes where there's phases. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay. For a while, a lot of people will be thinking about a certain thing or one type of problem set eats up the mind share. And then mm. for the next while, a new topic or hot, hot take has invaded the community per se. And, and I, I do like this idea of like how, how you can judge the community by if you ask a quote unquote stupid question. I think that's perfect. The only thing that drives me nuts sometimes is when someone will use a community form like Google Mm -hmm. and it's like, did you do any kind of research beforehand to try and figure this out on your own? Or are you just looking for other people to do that work for you? So that, that can be a little bit frustrating. Again, I've learned Mm -hmm. how to gently broach the topic as opposed to before I used to post a lot of the, do you know that website? Let me Google it for you. Have you ever seen that? Actually, No, no, just Google that (laughs) and you'll see. So anytime you want to be passive aggressive, (laughs) here's how you can do it. 
you just type in, let me Google that for you. And then it gives someone a screen recording of you. So you type in the question to let me Google that for you. And then it creates a URL of the screen oh. recording of you typing in that question in Google. And so it sends it to the person. You can send it oh. to the person. So I've stopped sick. sending that kind of stuff because I, re- I recognize that that's a little bit passive aggressive and somebody mm. is honestly probably just like, oh, I'm having a hard day and I'm trying to find the answer to this and I can't figure it out. But I think there's, there's two things that will, there's that where someone will use the community form as like their own personal Google and expect people to Google it for them or, or give them answers that they could easily find on Google. And then the other one is where they'll like expect people to do their homework for them. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And mm -hmm. so it's like, I've had to figure out, okay, maybe we should just create a homework channel. So people that are trying to get their homework done can talk with others that are trying to get their homework done. And, and so you, you have those types of interactions that happen but as far as the where people have trouble and what people are having the most trouble with, I don't know if I can say even what uh, what an interesting one is. I, I feel like a lot of stuff around rags these days, obviously. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean... You, you know, one, one thing that that's interesting is the what, quantif- what qualifies as learning? So for mm. instance, in my opinion, if you run some stuff with a hugging face library, I don't necessarily think you've learned, mm. but I think you're very effective at leveraging it. So it's the abstraction layers, I think, in the software realm, yes, you're effective. You can get this thing to production. Fantastic. And it, there's always an interesting layer of how does this thing actually work under the hood instead mm. of me calling the APIs? And um, that's one thing I've personally that's how I navigate the space of information versus just a tutorial that shows me a couple APIs. I'm good to go. Um, but in, in shifting from that, what do you now see as the, the top skills? Let's say for this year, because one thing I, I just picked up from you is, hey, these things come in waves. They come in phases. Uh, what are you yeah. seeing as like the top skill sets that people are trying to go after this year or last year? Yeah. Can I can I say something on on that last point before sure, yeah. I jump to the yeah, top yeah, skills sure. too? Yeah. Well, Cuz I think there is an interesting piece to that. Like what do you consider learning and and what actually constitutes that? Yesterday I was talking to a guy who has a startup in the healthcare space. Mm-hmm. And he launched his startup and nine months ago, he didn't even know how to code. He learned how wow. to code and he learned everything that he needed to know to create the product just mm-hmm. through studying with ChatGPT and basically getting a lot of the code from ChatGPT. And if it runs, cool. If it doesn't, then he would go back and try and talk with ChatGPT about how to make it run. And he was very open about it and saying, you know, I had the idea of the product. And his product is having a ton of success. That's beautiful. And so it's almost like, is, was there learning there? You know, it's the, there was a lot of learning, but it was different types of learning. He was one thing that I really admire that he did was there's a lot of challenges that he had to overcome. One, and mm-hmm. I think if I were to, think about doing that for myself in my life, there's probably a lot of times or roadblocks that you would hit and you could easily talk yourself out of it. Like the mental talk could get the best of you. And you say, ah, yeah, you know, I don't know how to code. And then you throw that in and you can use it as an excuse as to why you can't actually create a product that people Mm -hmm. love and they use. Or he's in the healthcare space, like getting HIPAA compliance. He said he spent every day for two months to be able to get the HIPAA compliance. And then he said he also, he doesn't have any background as a doctor, but he is serving, Hmm. like his end users are doctors. 
And so there's so many reasons why this shouldn't work. And he's just killing it because he has been able to bring this product mindset and building and really caring about the end user and building that empathy into the product and getting the feedback. And, and then when he doesn't know how to do something, he figures it out and he's resourceful enough to go and figure it out. So that just reminded me, what you were talking about earlier just reminded me of that uh, and thinking about how if you want, it, it just reminds me like, man, we can do anything. There's no blockers at all. Like blockers are all in our mind. That is the only thing that blocks us. So getting back to... Uh, the, wait, wait, before you, you move on there, I want to expand on this because <laughs> as a labeled data scientist, meaning the identity I've adopted so far <laughs> mm. um, in gathering data points, if I understood correctly, when you initially started the community, you were not technical. So no, now... I don't know. You, so like you're a leader of this very, very technical community, not having any sort of quote unquote technical experience initially. Um, and I think that's a beautiful data point because now I've shifted my own measure of success of whether or not I, I know something to, mm. can I build a product? Mm. So I've, I've set like an internal benchmark for myself. If I can't build a product on my own, I don't understand this thing. And, and that's like the, the forcing function I'm using. So I'm happy that you brought that up versus, oh, I could have read some paper and I understood this algorithm. Cool, I call the library. Great. Yeah. Can I now build a product? Can I now go that, do that full thing? Because to me, like when you watch the world, it's just products. It's, it's a series of exactly. products just going back and forth. So I, I'm very happy that you, um, you made that distinction. Can you talk about what your mindset was and how it shifted like you're leading this community you're not technical what types of anxieties did you have and how did that change over time oh yeah that's so assuming funny. you had anxieties yeah know. the <laughs> the funniest piece is if you go back to some of the first virtual meetups that we did you can see that i had no idea what the guest was talking about i had no idea and it was so obvious at least to me, when I go back and I look at it, because there was no back and forth. I would ask a question that I had crowdsourced from technical people that I knew, and then the guest would answer, and I'd be holding on to my seat trying to understand just a word or two, no clue what they were saying with all this technical jargon. And then they would finish, and I would wait a sec just to see if they were going to say anything else. And then I would go right into the next question. It would be like, okay, cool. And then next question, you know, because I couldn't have a conversation with them. There was no, <laughs> there was no back and forth because I had no idea what they just said. And I just hoped that people that were listening understood what they just said and didn't need any extra clarifications. And I imagined that if they did need clarification, they would write it in the chat because it was all live virtual sessions that we were doing. So... <laughs> That's where I started. Then for a while, I didn't feel comfortable interviewing people without someone technical as like a co-host. And mm -hmm. so a lot of the podcasts up until like last year always had co-hosts with me. And it was also mm -hmm. cool because it was fun. I got to see other people's perspectives but then at some point I realized, well, it's easier for me to organize all these podcasts if I just do it on my own. And mm -hmm. there was a little bit of fear there that oh, I'm not going to be able to go as deep. I don't know enough technically. I'm not sure I'm going to understand everything. But I quickly got over that after a few of them and I saw that the listener count or the downloads per episode didn't just drop off a cliff. And so, you know, that was oh, like the, okay. the imposter syndrome thinking like, oh, if it's just me, like nobody's actually going to want to listen. But luckily people tune in because of the guests, not for me. <laughs> so I've got that covered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I'm happy that you say that because I think there's more non-technical people than technical people. 
Hmm. And we're coming into an age where um, <clears throat> the value of a technical skill will become slightly less and less. A pure technical hmm. skill, not that everyone has this thing that can aid them on the technical hmm. component. So I'm happy that um, you know, your perfect data point of showcasing massive value with having a non-technical background. And I'm personally very interested in just this space of careers as well. Um, so mm-hmm. I find that it, it's interesting that you've been able to build something so big, so meaningful. And I, look, I took a look at your sponsors. So you're a sponsored oh, yeah. entity. And there's often a dichotomy. There's often a struggle with doing good for the community and then generating revenue. And, and there's this yeah. kind of clash sometimes. How oh, did yeah. you think about monetizing the community? And that may not necessarily be the actual term, but talk to us about that train of thought. Yeah, it, 100%. You have to be very careful with how you monetize the community per se. And the way that we do it is we don't really have any sponsors do anything in Slack. So that's like a sacred space per se, except for one channel where people can post like the stuff that they're doing and marketing material, per, and yeah, all that fun stuff. And what we've done is we've said, let's monetize some of the content that we put out. So the content is in forms of blog posts. It's in forms of the newsletter that goes out. It's in the form of the podcast that goes out or the virtual meetups. Or if we have, like we organize a panel or a round table session, or if we have the in-person meetups, like somebody's got to pay for the food and drinks and the venue. And so we get sponsors for all that fun stuff. And so that was, that was it. And I, basically took the approach that someone, one of my friends told me from back when I started, he was like, just try and outsource everything you don't like to do so that the community doesn't become monotonous for you and you're doing things that you don't want to do. And so the reason that we brought on sponsors was so that I could have money to pay other people to do shit that I don't like doing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One, Mm -hmm of which is dealing with sponsors. <laughs> and so I got somebody, <laughs> I don't know if that's a, uh, <laughs> a bit of an inception thing there or what, but the, you know, when it comes to, you know, we're recording a podcast right now. There's a lot that goes into the before the podcast and the after the podcast mm-hmm. to get it up and yes. get the description and the abstract and edit the video or, get the key takeaways, all of that stuff. And there's a lot of AI tools that have come out that help you, but there's no AI tool that downloads the video, puts it into Descript, lets you, that edits it for you, then uploads the video to YouTube, adds the abstract, uploads the video to Spotify, adds the abstract, creates the show notes and all that, and sends it to the guest, tells the guest, here's some clips for you. There's a million different things that you've got going on. And so I recognized that when I was the one that had to do all of that stuff, so much was falling through the cracks. Yes. And I wasn't giving the guests a proper experience Mm. because I was thinking about all the stuff that I needed to do. And I would just go on to the next guest and like, oh, I need to do all this stuff for the next guest. And then maybe some things for the past guests would slip through the cracks and I wouldn't actually respect the appearance of the guests that came on. And so getting back to the whole sponsorship thing, like we decided to bring on sponsors so that I could hire people to help me with all of that and I could do the fun stuff. And we just make sure that there's like a clause in the sponsor contract that basically says the information that you collaborate with us on, it Mm -hmm. cannot be marketing. It cannot be sales. It has to Hmm. be aimed at a technical audience and it has to be educational. I'm glad that you 
you expanded on this because <clears throat> I think people who think about growing their own community, growing their own brand, growing their own newsletter, um, growing their own podcast, for instance, my, mm-hmm. my journey into podcasting, I went through all the editing pains and quickly realized I am a significant bottleneck to progress. So yeah. now I have a full-time editor. I, I'm happy to pay that person their fair share just because it, it enables me to scale. Um, and then I think one thing I'd like to attempt to normalize is this notion of not necessarily sales and marketing, but more so, hey, people have to earn money from the shit that they do, right? Yeah, Community is all cool and shit, but I have to eat, you have to eat, you have kids to feed. Uh, so there is this notion of, yes, at some point, we're going to ask you to buy something because the nice, really high paying data scientist, MLOps engineer job that you have the people mm-hmm. in that company have to go sell some shit. And if exactly. they don't sell some shit, you ain't have no big salary to go yeah. contribute to open source and all that stuff. So it, it's a very weird dynamic, I think, sometimes. Um, so I put on conferences so I can, I can see how sensitive people are. I'm yeah. also very sensitive to it. And you, you want to give that person a good experience. But also, you actually can't build, in my opinion, a really meaningful sustainable community without these sponsored partners that can fuel the ecosystem and allow folks like yourself to do what you do best and and leave the other things to you know what other people are good at so i'm I'm happy that you uh, expanded on that to be honest and and you know calling some spades uh, and there is uh, i spent a lot of brain cycles on how to diversify our revenue mm-hmm. streams. Mm-hmm. And so for the longest time, it was, again, it's like, well, I'm serving the community. What do they want? What kind of a product can I create that the community would be stoked to have? And so right now, what we, what we kind of landed on is this, there's one type of person or actually the companies that are trying to sell into the community. And so in that regard, it's almost like B to B to C. And what I realized is that we are in service of the community members. We're not in service of the sponsors. So if the sponsors want to do something that we feel will destroy that trust, or it will wreck the community, it's not worth it. It's very short-sighted to do that for a few bucks. And so we we also, like going back to diversifying the revenue streams, what we're trying to do this year, and we have some, some people that thanks to all of the sponsors we could hire and are now focusing on this, we're creating a whole learning platform. And we're also crowdsourcing all of the courses that are being created from community members. And we're figuring out a way to do revenue shares with people in the community. So there's so many experts in the community that have so much to share and so much to teach that we're figuring out, well, let's get them to teach that. We host it on our learning platform. Mm -hmm. We get the community to, in a way, it's almost like this virtuous cycle that the more stuff that we put on there, the more people it attracts into the community and the community itself can start paying things. Because I, what I didn't like was this idea of creating a gated community, which some people do and some communities are like that where you have to pay to join the community. And that gives you, there's pros and cons to that. I had thought about it a lot, man. I'm sure you've thought about it too, but at the end of the day, it's not what we wanted to go for. We wanted to figure out if there was a different way to diversify the revenue streams. And so what we landed on is the learning platform. And so the learning platform is basically for the community, by the community, <laughs> the for us, by us. It's the FUBU mm-hmm. of MLOps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I always love some of the, the interesting anecdotes that you come up with. It's, it's always a good time. Yeah, I, um, I try. Talk to me about how come you didn't go to the Discord? I think that's also mm. well, 
uh, I'm assuming there's not a Discord because I, I looked on on the site. Yeah, no. You maintain Slack. That's an interesting strategy. Any thoughts there? So we started in 2020, and in 2020, I had only ever used Slack. And I think Discord was still something that it was very gamer heavy and it there wasn't quite the crypto boom that catapulted Discord into the spotlight. And so we joined Slack because it was where everybody already was in their day-to-day -day working. And then also there was ideas of like, oh, we should migrate to Discord. But by that time, <laughs> it was like, oh, there's a thousand people in this Slack. Like, we're going to get all those thousand people to go over to Discord? No, that's not a good idea. And, and also Discord, some of the functionality, I think the main functionality was that I was lacking was, this, was threads. It just felt like Discord was a mess uh. in a way. I think there mm -hmm. are some very strong benefits that Discord has versus Slack. I like them both. Okay. I'm going to say that right now. I also like forums. Those are very useful too if you can figure out how to make those work and make it be something that people go back to, but that's a whole nother story. And so we just never went to Discord because we started on Slack and then we just kept going. Nice. And so far, like it's been working out. It worked. Yeah. If yeah. anything, okay. these days, funny enough, I make it really, really hard to join the Slack in a way. Like I make it very friction full. Or hmm. Is that the opposite okay. of frictionless? Yeah. I, I introduce a lot of friction because hmm. what I got tired of seeing was people coming in, not appreciating the Slack, just using it to spam all the channels. And so mm -hmm. we do a lot more pre gating, essentially. Yeah, right? and, and screening now, yeah. and and it's it's helped cut down on a lot of that, to be honest. And so that helps. Like you have to apply to join Slack, and I have to go in and manually mm -hmm. accept you, which I usually will do on Friday. And there's like hundreds of people that have applied, <laughs> and. And you also have to put your name, your like title, your LinkedIn, so that we can see like, are you in SDR? <laughs> are you mm. in sales? Are you in marketing? Or are you an actual engineer? And so mm -hmm. that makes a difference too. Okay, that's an interesting question. What is the importance of the meme channel? The meme channel? The, <laughs> the importance of... I think that's how we can stay able to push back on like the the things that were being fed right i know i just i spoke earlier on how i try not to be so aggressive towards the different uh different companies that are putting out what i would consider like not ideal marketing or or just like bad stuff but this I think goes beyond that and it's more like culturally and especially now that AI is in the forefront of the culture. We get to push back on that and like, for example, one of my favorite things that use was a meme that was popular before the chat GPT craze. It was like someone talking about, oh, what's the difference between AI and ML? And someone said, if it's, if it's written in code or if it's in like a Jupyter notebook, it's ML. If it's in a PowerPoint presentation, it's AI. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. But that's, that's kind of the, the thing is that it's, it goes beyond. It's, it's a way for us to not just like eat the cultural narratives that are being spewed out. I wanted to ask, you have, you have time after a schedule yeah. time? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, I don't even know what time it is. Cool. Yeah, um, I'm good. So what is interesting thing about communities as well? Um, are lurkers, do lurkers add value? So a lurker mm -hmm. is someone who's just, uh, I've heard you yeah. say that sometimes they're observing, sometimes they're just there collecting data. 
learning from afar. How do you define a lurker? And you know, how do you see them adding value or maybe not adding value to the community? It's a tough question. Yeah. Do they add value? I feel like yes. And the reason I would say yes is because you potentially, you, like you don't know everything that's happening with every person that is in Slack as a lurker and specifically in this case, Slack, right? Like they may be seeing things that are happening in the community and reading threads and then they go and they enact change in their company because of that, or they're able to take screenshots and then share it with their boss and say, look, here's something we might want to be interested in. Or they join one of the many ways that we have things going on. Like they come to the virtual conference and they tell their friends, whatever it may be. So there's a million manifestations of how a lurker can add value, even if they're not participating directly in a thread. I'm a lurker, by the way. So I just want you to oh, you are? <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll forgive you for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, well, it's interesting because I don't know if this happened to me in the NFT thing. So they were, you know, I was in hundreds of different discords. Yeah. I don't have time for that shit, right? No. You have your full-time job, et cetera, et cetera. And now when you have such varied interests, let's say in the machine learning space, you know, you go hunting for different pieces of information that will advance your career. At least that's why I typically go join mm-hmm. a community first, just to make sure I advance and then you also see where you could contribute as well. And not all the time you have the, the time to just, or the, the mental energy to give, because sometimes you're doing it late at night and you're just like, yeah. oh, I see that question. Oh, that's a tough question. That I can answer it, but <laughs> I'm not there right now. So it, I asked yeah. that question just to, um, just to see where, how you were viewing it. So it, that, that was an interesting answer as yeah. well. Yeah. And I will, agree with that. And I think even more so, like we mentioned earlier, is the more people you have in a server or a workspace, I think the more that it creates that barrier where you're like, oh, yeah, I could answer that. But you want to maybe make sure that you're not coming off in a certain way. And Mm -hmm, it ends up mm -hmm. being a commitment to answer that. And so, especially if it's like, oh, you just interact once or twice in the threads. And so it's a whole different scenario in that regard. But yeah, in general, I think lurkers, they've got, they bring a lot of value in different ways, right? Talk to me about what are two mistakes that you made? I know, I'm sure you made many more, but what yeah. are two mistakes that <laughs> you've made in this whole community building process that? Uh, you wish you didn't, or what can people learn today, from that process? I could give you two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, some of the major ones, let's see. I think learning, man, there's so many. There's so, so much great learnings that I've had. And it's, it's cool. This que- I like this question because it's forcing me to reflect back on what some of them have been. But understanding the power of writing and understanding how valuable it is to write things down and then socialize that with people as opposed to just getting on a call and hypothesizing with people and setting up, you know, like I, you may have got this by now, but I'm not necessarily an operations guy, but I've learned to be. And it was amazing. One thing that was another one of those like moments of like, oh my God, this changes everything <laughs> was when I recognized that if I can properly express where I need help and what I would like to see, like what my vision is, then I don't have to necessarily be the one that goes out and does it. And so I think the mistake there, just reverse engineering from that is trying to do everything myself and trying to think that if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And so letting go of that and recognizing that 
instead of that mentality of if I don't do it, it's not going to get done, I, I'm much more effective if I adopt the mentality of learning how to express my vision in writing and then create, like, inspire others to jump on board with me and yes. execute that vision. This is a very interesting point. <clears throat> One thing I've learned from working at NVIDIA, uh, Jensen was, was saying, um, how hard you work as a volunteer sport. And I thought mm -hmm. that was extremely insightful. And, and one of the unique parts of NVIDIA culture is that they're only volunteers. So when like a big project comes up, yeah, you can get, okay, you're, you're on this project, yes. But oftentimes, like if you want to spearhead a project, you're told, okay, you now you have to go recruit people. Even if mm -hmm. you're, there's no like big shots, like, you have to go encourage people to join your mission. So it seems like um, this is the same as well. And then I, I could only imagine what it was, but it must have felt like doing podcasts, running community, watching every message in Slack every day, yeah. thinking about sponsorships. It goes beyond a full-time job, actually. Yeah. And that is another piece. Like that is a huge learning that I've had too. And coming back to the mistakes. So you asked for two. I'll give you the, the second one probably was not being focused enough. And I still don't know if I fully learned this one, but I've I feel like now we have changed things in the community so that whereas before when we would get sponsors, it was a sponsorship package for like 20 different things. And so that meant that we had to do a newsletter with them, a blog with them, a podcast, and then a virtual meetup and an in-person meetup. and a virtual panel and all of these different things. And that meant that I had to be making sure that all of these different pieces of the community were running and they were going. And so it's like you're spreading yourself a little bit thin trying to have 20 different initiatives. And that was... Uh, a huge one is saying, okay, out of all of these, which ones do I enjoy the most? Which ones do I feel like are the most valuable for sponsors? And let's trim that down a bit so that mm. we can focus. And you're still able to generate the revenue that you need, keep the people in the community happy, even by you know, trimming. Well, yeah, that's, it's funny you mentioned that because this year, so we're what, in January, 2024, we just are starting with this new package that it's a little bit nerve wracking because now it's a whole new package and we're going out there and we're talking to sponsors and we're mm -hmm. testing the waters. And so the new package is infinitely easier for us to fulfill. And so it's much yes. better for the community, but we still have to is like- it valuable for the sponsors? Yeah, we still have to prove if mm -hmm. this new like business model works. So that's, uh, it's a little scary in that regard, but it's also, I know it's the right way forward because what we were doing wasn't necessarily working that well. And there was all kinds of like holes in the bucket, you could say it was a leaky bucket. Huh. I, I like that analogy and to be honest, targeting of people, everyone has to generate sales. And we'll, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about sales coming up because I think selling to data scientists is one of the most painful experiences that you can have. <laughs> I sell to them uh, every day, yeah. essentially. And, and I, I guess I have to sell to myself, which is painful enough. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's good that you are articulating the realities and you know, do keep us posted on whether or not that new type of sponsorship that's more community aligned, less, I wouldn't say it's less sponsorship aligned. It finds mm -hmm. a better long-term balance for the sus sustainability of the community, um, yeah. but also providing a lot more value to the sponsors as well. Talk to me about sales. Um, 
What have you learned about sales? I, I know you have a sales background. Now you're essentially selling. And I think there's often times a negative connotation to mm-hmm. selling. It, it might be like, oh, we just create this thing and like we're good to go. Um, what, what's your internal thoughts on selling? Yeah, huge learning for me when it came to learning how to be better at sales. And I'll caveat this with like, I don't consider myself an incredible sales person at all. But one learning is that it's just finding if it's the right fit or not. And so you have to explore, you have to make sure that you ask questions and that you're aligned on everything. And it's not necessarily like mental tricks on getting someone to sign on the dotted line. It's more about does this work and being okay with asking harder questions, being okay with really digging in. And even though you may in your head lose the sale, if you find this out, it's better that you lose the sale than it's better that you lose the sale earlier rather than later, right? You don't want to spend six months on a sale only to find out that there was a deal breaker that you could have known about in the first week or two weeks. So that's one piece of sales. The other piece is that it's just a grind. You got to just show up every day and do the work. And so that you can't expect like sales to come easy because sales like it's you know you you want to continuously be i i mean if well no maybe maybe i won't go down that route but it's like you got to be continuously kind of filling up the pipeline and making sure that you're able to to try and hit those targets that you've set for yourself or that somebody else has set for you so there's that that piece I mean, there's so much in sales. One friend, one of the best books I think that was out there that I read early on in sales was like, you can't teach a guy to ride a bicycle at a seminar or something like that. That's one of like, it's from the 60s or something. And it's an amazing book. Yeah, amazing book on (laughs) just how you want to ask questions, you want to be able to push back, you really have to validate questions. And some people, you've heard some people maybe have talked about it, like uh, one of my sales mentors says, you have to find out what the three W's are, or some people call it the three Y's. Why buy anything? Why buy us? And then why buy now? And you want to really dig in on those three W's. And if you can get to the truth of that and your, what you're selling is best aligned for what someone is trying to alleviate these pains with, then it's just like, a, it's a good fit. And of course you should, yes. you should see yourself as the only option. I like that. Um, so thanks for chatting with me about sales, just because we each work for a company and to some degree, like I'm a customer facing data scientist, so it's my job to drive adoption. So there's a, in my, in my mind, there's a sales component to that. And mm-hmm. when you create any piece of software or anything, you have to drive adoption that driving adoption that is sales, even if you might be generating revenue directly. Yeah. So it, I'm happy that we can kind of discuss this topic openly, to be honest. Um, talk about podcasts, you know, I want to respect your time. Uh, you have 200 and I believe 98 episodes by now. Yeah. How did your podcasting style evolve over time? And any advice you have for like people like myself? doing? A yeah, the, there's a great book on podcasting that I try and read like once a year. It's mm. called Make Noise. And Ooh, okay, doing it, doing it. That that book is from one of the 
podcast producers of NPR and later like mm -hmm. uh, like Serial and all those famous podcasts that came out. I think he's he's got his name all over everything. I can't remember the name of the author right now, but it is uh, incredible because it helps you understand just how do you position the podcast? What is the need for a podcast like you're creating? Why is it different than anything? Who's it for? All of that fun stuff. And I think for me personally as like a host, podcasting has helped me learn how to articulate myself better. I also heard once, and this one I, I kind of hold on to in each episode. It's like there's, what was it? Hold on. I say I hold on to it in each episode and then I'm not going to be able to <laughs> remember exactly what it was. But hold on, let me see if I can remember this. It's something along the lines of, there's only three ways that you can respond to someone when they finish talking. One is you can disseminate what they say. So you can uh, debate what they say. So basically you throw it back at them. You try it. So you can disseminate. You can say like, all right, let me, let me see if I'm understanding this correctly. You can debate it or you can ask the next question. And that's kind of like what I, I heard once. And I was, I was thinking about that because it is easier to keep the ball rolling per se. I think if you are able to do that and continue with the conversation. And then the, the other piece was I'll listen back to myself now. I try to take note of the different filler words that I use so that I can be more vigilant about when I'm using them. I will also recognize how I speak and what kind of mannerisms I use so that if there are things that I feel like I could do better, I learn from it. Like when the football players or the basketball players, they watch tape, right? It's one of those where I'm going back and listening to myself and I'm watching tape of how I did in that interview, what I think I could do better, what I feel like, hmm, maybe I don't necessarily need to do that. Or when I thought I was being funny, I wasn't actually being funny. I'm, it's kind of cringe. That's usually what the feeling is like, maybe that joke didn't land as I thought it would when I was saying it in the podcast. So that's some of the, the other pieces around it for sure. Yeah. I, I think in doing, starting this one, I had another one. I'm starting another one soon, mm. actually recorded some initial episodes. So now I'll have three three podcasts. So I've, I've done something slightly different. Um, there's a prep when you come into an episode because you want to bring the best experience for a guest. You want yeah. to also represent your best because it's your reputation that's on the line. Um, what is your preparation process? For this one, you didn't have any prep. I was literally <laughs> talking to you, walking into the house and you walk straight into it. So in my mind, <laughs> It's a sign of your maturity in the podcasting process. Like you just roll up and you dive into it, even though you're not interviewing, but I, I've seen you ask mm -hmm. me some questions as well. But any thoughts on the prep for an episode? Yeah, I, I do like to prep. And that's one of the things that the people that I've hired will help with. We try and get a cool. guest, the guests of our podcast, we get them to fill out a form, which will go over topics that they want to talk about, any relative mm -hmm. links, like are there blogs that I should be looking at? And then I'll also do a little research. Sometimes there's stuff on the internet that the people have written. Sometimes there's not. It's like there's nothing on the internet because it's just some random engineer that has a lot of good things to say. And, you know, it's like finding needle in a haystack and, or a diamond in the rough. And you're like, wow, that was an incredible conversation but they they don't write about it they don't do much they just jump on a podcast and then they'll blow my mind but mm -hmm. as far as the the other pieces of prep yeah like going back to just trying as 
be in a good headspace because the energy you bring to the conversation, people, I think they feel that and they notice if, if like I'm down and stressed and thinking about a bunch of stuff, that's not really what people are. <laughs> that's not like the kind of energy that I think people are looking to tune into. So can I bring my best self when I get into the podcast? And can I also make sure to try and focus 100% on the podcast and what the guest is saying and not get distracted by my own thoughts or like looking at whatever Slack message came through or, or browsing LinkedIn while the, the guest is saying what they're saying. It's like, no, is there, is there something that I can just try and be present and soak it all up and learn from mm-hmm. the guests, like truly learn and be inquisitive and be interested in what they have to say. Why do you continue other than like, it's a part of the community. What parts of the podcasting process do you find fun? Cause it, I'm, I'm learning about you in terms of the fun is your fuel to progress. Mm-hmm. What, what's that for you? I, would say that I have a blast learning from people, getting mm-hmm. to talk to people, be, getting to learn about what they're working on and how they overcome challenges. I would credit like all of my growth over the past three, four years, which may or like it's debatable if there was a lot or a little bit, <laughs> but the... <laughs> The growth that I have had, it's because I've been able to talk with people about what they're working on and how they approach things and how they see the world. And so it's fun because I get to get a different perspective. I also get to have great interactions and and build the network of people that I know and that I've had conversations with and then hopefully keep those relationships even after we stop recording, you know? Yes. Indeed. What keeps you motivated to keep going? Oh, what keeps me motivated? That's, a, that's an interesting one. Because I don't have, I don't know if I like consciously have anything where it's like, this is, this keeps me motivated. Mm, I do think, okay. yeah, uh, <laughs> when I put it like that, it almost feels like I'm just like a drone that just goes and doesn't know why he's going. <laughs> I've just been programmed this way. I don't know what it is. I just have to move forward. Uh, I would say, though, like if I were to reflect right here, it's it's definitely the learnings and continuing mm-hmm. to learn mm-hmm. and continuing to get to speak to people that like, in all honesty, I probably have no right talking to, right? Like if we were, to be honest, like four years ago, I was working some random job and was nobody. And now uh, I, over the last four years, I've been able to speak to so many incredible people. And it's because of the podcast Mm -hmm. mainly. I mean, also because I meet them in Slack or I meet them in local meetups or, or all these different ways. But that's one thing that I think would keep me going or that does keep me going. It's being able to interact with incredible human beings and learn from them. Hmm, Beautiful. So it sounds like uh, you being able to, to do a lot of those things. Actually, here here is the real question. How do you measure success in your career? Hmm. And, and the, to be honest, the, the true reason for that question. So I, I launched another podcast, not unofficially called progress guaranteed. Nice. So what, what gets me going? I'm obsessed with understanding why people are the way they are. How the hell do they stay motivated? Because I personally struggle with that quite a lot. Uh, and then what drives people to achieve certain things in their life? So with that, because I, I, I've seen different definitions of success, right? I've seen people who don't have a ton of money and man, they're happy. Like you could kill them today and they don't care. Like there's such joy in their life. And I've seen people with a ton of money and all of those types of things. So what, what is success for you? What does success look like, man? That's, that's another great one. I think I've never had uh, any problems with motivation, which luckily from my side, that's 
That's something that I've been very fortunate with. <laughs> I get in fucking cold water. Uh, you got to be very motivated to do that shit, right? Like <laughs> that or have a, a little bit of weirdness. And the other thing is, so speaking about like when I became a parent, so I was less motivated I think to go out and like have a career or get a job, a real job before my daughter was born. And then once my daughter was born, things kind of shifted where I recognized because I was teaching English as a second language and that was great, but it was, you know, like three months out of the year, I wouldn't work because I would be on vacation on the beach. And nobody wanted to learn English in Spain from June till September. So what happened was, getting back to the question, I think, like, what does success look like? I am already in a place that I never would have dreamed to be in. And if you asked me, like, four years ago, what does success look like? I kind of... I wouldn't have had an answer. I still, and I know I'm trying to be more intentional about like where I want to go and what I want my life to do. So maybe success for now just looks like defining what success looks like in that way and being more intentional with how I spend my time and what I do with my life, quote unquote. Still haven't mm -hmm. figured what I'm going to do with my life. Just haven't figured that one out. But <laughs> there is a... I mean, like I do, the thing is that I guess I'm not super worried about that because I feel like I've, I'm pretty good in life, you know, like I, I'm happy. I make sure I'm very diligent about meditating every day, like in the morning and at night. And I've been that way since like I was 19. So since I have that foundation, I think that changes a lot that I don't necessarily care what happens on my on the material plane as much as I'm more focused on what happens internally. And so because of that, I guess, you know, like I, I'm weary of setting success metrics on a internal, like a spiritual practice. I think that's again, like kind of setting myself up for, for failure. I just know that if I do the work and I put in the work, that I will grow and I've seen that firsthand. And so I can only imagine that another decade of that is just going to deepen my ability to, to feel like peace throughout the day, to be happy, to have less fear in all aspects of my life. I appreciate you. I really appreciate you sharing that. And I had no intention of pinning you to a definition. I was pure curiosity. Yeah. Um, and that, that's nice because I haven't found many people who actively do ice baths. I don't actively do them. I've done them. They suck. And <laughs> it's nice to see that you actually do them in really frigging cold weather, which is, mm. you know, hot I can only you. do it in the winter. Yeah. And that's the only time what? that it's, it works because it's, oh, just it's actually outside. frozen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the summer, it doesn't okay, work because my is, um, big old dumpster doesn't, doesn't actually freeze. But anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, no, that was good. This was a good, um, you know, we're, we're near the end here. And I, I think one side of the story that doesn't often get told is who the person is behind their great accomplishment. So I, I appreciate mm -hmm. you sharing the deeper side of, you know, ice baths, meditation. I would have thought that you meditate. I, would, I may have like <laughs> assumed that. Okay, maybe by yeah. long hair, I'm categorizing and putting labels on you. Uh, <gasps> that, that you're a spiritual person. Um, but it's cool to see that you, you've actively been doing that for a long time and it's mm. cool that you've achieved all these great things. So I, uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. All right. What, any other books you recommend people read? Are you a big reader by the way? Oh yeah. I oh, love books. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. I mean, it, it really, <laughs> it depends on what you're looking for, right? Like I've got. Give, give me, give me three that come to, just come to your mind. They don't have to be the best. The three that just they're at the top of the queue. <laughs> I read, I guess, the ones that I 
have it's probably recency bias, but ones that I really enjoy. One is story worthy. And that Ooh. is all about telling a good story. It's mm-hmm. from this guy mm-hmm. who's the champion, the moth champion. The moth podcast is also great if you're interested in that. Uh, okay. I also am, I really like, oh my God, there's so many. If I would have to go through, I'll look at my bookshelf right now and say which ones. Obviously, that's, like- That's a whole next episode. Yeah. <laughs> Demetrius exactly. says books and- podcast <laughs> which ones which ones i really enjoy i'm uh, a big fan of the book if you're into like community and De- devrel there's a great mm-hmm, book mm-hmm. that is the business value of developer relations i think that's a, a really good one i also like um i think it's called contagious or something if you're into marketing and how like ideas mm-hmm. marketing ideas go and they pop I think it's called contagious it's don't quote me on that one that, i'll give you another one <laughs> because that one isn't necessarily the one i if you're into so dune's coming out this year uh dune 2 mm-hmm. the movie i've read i read all the dune books that's great if you want like fiction stuff that's worth going and checking out and then if you want like more spiritual stuff i've got a whole lot of those mm-hmm. that um, one that I'm looking at right now is Seeking the Heart of Wisdom by Jack Cornfield. I also am a huge fan of A Course in Miracles. I also like the Bhagavad Gita. That one is, of course, like you can always come back to that. And it's almost Have like- Have you read The Celestine Prophecy? Oh yeah. That's another great one. Another ooh, That one's fun. Ooh, ooh. Those are, <laughs> yeah, you're always- <laughs> That that uh, that actually is a is a beautiful one. Um, and there's another yeah, one that, that book is up, right yeah. up the alley with that one. Uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. But l- last but not oh, least, you would, you would really love. Um, remember that traveler's gift book I was telling you about? Yeah, you, I gotta check like, that out. I feel like I've heard of books. It. You would you'd really like it. Yeah, yeah it's, I gotta it's check super, that out. Uh, low key. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Other one, I would say, like if you're into autobiographies, Creativity mm-hmm. Inc. is brilliant. That's from what? the Pixar guy, Ed. And then also Shoe Dog was another great one. If you, That's mm. from the Nike dude. I have that one. Yeah. Yeah, that one's really good. Um, huh. Wow. The tr- this is like the most books I've gotten. From my guess, and this is beautiful. Most recommendation. I have, I have some of these, and it's just to find the time, and also to be in the mental space to, to yeah. really absorb it. So, oh, parenting books too. I read a ton of those mm. these days, like gentle parenting type shit. Because I don't want to <laughs> freak out on my daughter <laughs> trying to <laughs> see. Yeah. This is why I have to meditate every day. Because. <laughs> <laughs> Really, the ones who who meditate are hopefully it's like I need it the most. That's what just to be sane. But the uh, the parenting books, there's one that's like how to talk so that little kids will listen. That one's mm. great. It, it helped me understand how to take the like emotional charge and like almost like flow of creativity and flow of energy that they have and um and direct that flow as opposed to like trying to create a dam or block Mm. it or swim upstream with that flow it's like can we direct this flow so some little tidbits that i use every day almost are things where you know my daughter doesn't want to get ready for school and now my daughter my oldest daughter's five she doesn't want to get ready for school and so it's like hey what if I count to 10. Do you think you can get ready before I count to 10? And so trying to make like games out of getting ready wow. or or even just setting up like, okay, a checkbox of you do this and then you do this. These are all the things that we need to do before we get ready. Or she doesn't want to go to the car. And so it's like, do you think we could hop on one foot to the car? And so you're what? able to <laughs> get them to do things you want. It's It's 
let's be honest, it's just how to manipulate little kids. That's what they should have named the fucking book. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm that I'm thinking because, about it. <laughs> like in the Caribbean, you have none of that. Like a Caribbean yeah. parent, your ass getting beat. Oh, you don't want to go to school today? Oh, really? Oh, you'll be beaten to go to school. Like I got yeah. so much flicks growing up as a kid. I was such a stubborn child. Um, oh, that's belt. so funny. That's, that's, you know, you open the Caribbean book of parenting, you open it, there's just a belt <laughs> in there with you. And it, it, it's, it's oh, dumb. there's none um, of this gentle, none of that God. shit. <laughs> Caribbean parents, please. Gen, gen who? Yeah. Um, to, to, I, I got to run soon, but um, okay, here's an interesting, my well, last rapid round of questions, right? Yeah, hit me. So you're stuck on an island with a specialized chef and he can cook Mm. any meals I love that you it. want anything but you only get two yeah. what do you have him cook <sighs> him or who whatever so I'm pretty much uh, <laughs> vegan these days but mm. like I, I have the occasional ice cream so I can't quite call Ooh. myself vegan but I would say and are we talking like uh, three course meals or is it like a one plate meal? What Anything. Are we saying? He's, 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 this person is a world class chef. All but right. So, this is the rest of your life, that's all you get two meals. Yeah. I would probably go with, well, if I had this, <laughs> if I did, I'm, my first instinct is like, oh, pad thai uh, mm. with like tofu or something, or mm-hmm. a, I would do some kind of a doll with um yeah. like yellow doll with lemon rice that is also incredible mm. and it gets you the protein and yep. and then some ice cream for dessert <laughs> <laughs> um, oh i like that oh that's yeah. a good one that's or um, yeah i mean oh man hmm. yeah that's probably what i would go with that's what i would go okay. with it feels like okay, doll, that would be the most doll, lemon nutrient rice, complete and ice cream yeah. That's cool, man. Uh, what's one thing that brings you joy? Hanging out with my daughters easily. Beautiful. Beautiful. And this last question is not about you trying to be famous or anything. It's just about with the people that you've interacted with over your life. Mm-hmm. Whenever that ends, what do you want people to remember about you? Yeah, man, I don't, I'm not sure I have a good answer for this there's by the way things there, that I'm thinking, has, it's like there's no good answer yeah there's you. i'm thinking like the that it's almost like oh he was a joy to be around i i had a big heart i was selfless in my service and that Yeah, I'm not necessarily sure. Like, I want them to be able to put words around it. It's just like mm, the, just feeling the feeling of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, I, I want to share one thing that I've felt in learning about yeah. you over the years is that you can be successful being your authentic self mm. in the public. That's, that's what I personally want you to, to receive today. Like I've been spinning and inspired by you just going out there, doing your thing and, um, just providing value to people over time. So I, I wanted to thank yeah. you for having that courage to, or bullheadedness to just say, okay, I'm going to do, do my thing. And um, I truly appreciate your time. You know, I took two hours out of your life and I hope the audience great. receives what I received today. But most importantly, um, that you feel, hopefully I feel some of your cup of joy. To oh, 100%. Here. It's cool. These questions I don't get asked on a daily basis. And usually I'm the one that's doing the asking. And yes. so it's been great reflecting on some of this and getting to just go deeper into these ideas. And so I appreciate you prodding me and prompting me with some of this. Beautiful. Well, I appreciate your time and, you know, we'll, we'll definitely 
probably have you for a follow-up episode on as the community evolves. So once again, yeah. do join the MLOps community. Have fun with Demetrius, follow his podcast, and, and do as much as you can to learn about the evolving field of, what is it? Generative? Generative <laughs> AI ops? What, what are we calling it? The, generative oh, DevOps. Generative, that was yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah. Generative DevOps. Oh, man. That's so funny. Yeah. Vibes. You know what I'm just waiting on. for? I'm waiting for What's you that? to just drop all of the need to be understood and give us the real deep Caribbean accent, like the shit that I wouldn't <laughs> oh. even understand, right? That's what I want to hear. That's what I'm okay. hoping you're going to intro this with, right? Ooh, ooh, maybe. I. So it's interesting. My Caribbean accent really only starts to come out. I, when I talk to another Caribbean person, because yeah. I just need, it, it's almost like I'm a language model. So if someone prompts me with a Caribbean accent, I'm like, ah, <laughs> and then they come out. Um, it's, the last thing I'll say is like, it's really funny when people bring out a uh, voice AI. I'm just like, uh, okay, come go talk to a Jamaican and let's see if this thing yeah. can understand a Jamaican or a Caribbean person. That's the, when we get there, we've hit AJI. I'm convinced. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Oh, I appreciate awesome. your time, man. Respect. Yeah, take it easy, Mark. Thanks, man. All right. See you.